Hello there, welcome to Proper DIY. My name is Stuart Matthews and this is part two of the Garage to Workshop conversion series where you're going to see me complete this fake garage door that's also got a hidden access. Now where is it? Welcome back to part two of my garage to workshop conversion where I'll be completing the garage door build. If you haven't already done so I would highly recommend that you see part one first. Link on the screen and in the description below. However if you don't want to here's a quick summary. I drilled this to fix these then drilled here to bolt on some of these. I put two of these in, rolled this out, can't remember why, did lots of measuring, sawing and drilling from multiple angles. Made 10 of these which I've since scrapped, cut a load of ply, lugged it about, got covered in plastic and it ended up with this. Yes, three months since I finished this. Well, there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, I've been really busy with projects. You would have seen this in the background to most of my projects over the last two or three months. But the main reason is that this centre section here, which is like a four foot wide demountable section, it's going to be invisible from the outside and I can only open it from the inside. I can only finish this once I've got another access to this garage. So now I've got that other access. I've just finished putting in the lintel and the new doorway to the side of the garage here, which I've had to finish first, which also will be part three of this workshop build. That's my excuse anyway. So I've got three things left to do now. I've got the cladding to go on the outside of this wall to make it look like a standard garage door. And unfortunately, because of lockdowns, I can't find any pressure treated cladding anywhere at the moment. So I've had to go for standard redwood. I've got the insulation to go in the middle of this void and I haven't got any problems with noise here. So I'm just going to be using standard rock wall insulation it's fairly cheap and cheerful and obviously the last thing to do is to clad this side of the wall i'm not going to be using plasterboard for that i'm going to be using plywood this being a workshop i think i'm going to be fixing things to this wall on and off over the next few years and i'd rather be fixing into ply than plasterboard so the redwood cladding i ordered from the local builders merchants a couple of days ago and should be turning up anytime now the TGV cladding came in 4.2 metre lengths. As I needed around 2 metre lengths, I cut them in half so I could move them about easily. In the workshop, I gave them a couple of coats of paint on all sides. I used masking tape on the DPM plastic to be able to mark horizontal and vertical datums on the black surface. Why does masking tape do that? I think it's really poor that masking tape I've had in my collection since 1998 just rips whenever it wants to. I'll have to try to get a refund. I then changed from vintage masking tape to vintage duct tape, which worked a lot better. My cheap laser level, as you can see here, even works in daylight. It's a great bit of kit and I'll be doing a review on it very soon. The Amazon link for it is in the description below. I have to pause here because it was at this point when I was doing the setting out on the door I made an executive decision to get rid of the windows. There's two reasons for this. One, over the last couple of months I found filming in the workshop easier with no natural light coming in. And two, my wife suggested it looked better without them. So, decision made. The windows are no more. Around both the perimeter and the central door opening I stapled insect net into the ply before fixing the treated 35 by 20 battens. Once the battens are fixed, I can fold the netting back over onto them and staple them, thus ending up with a creepy crawly free air gap. I simply screwed the battens horizontally to the wall at around 500 centres and at 250 centres around the door and the perimeter, just to help fix the insect netting and give the perimeter a little bit more strength. Once I'd finished the setting out on the door, I knew exactly the length of the cladding panels I needed so I could set up a stop block and cut all 52 boards to their final length. I liberally coated all the cut ends with a couple of rounds of water repellent sealer and also painted them once dry. 
To help install the boards and to keep them at a constant level, I fixed a temporary batten accurately at the bottom so they could sit on it as I pinned them in place. Around the centre door, I fixed the boards so an even number of boards was slightly wider than the opening, so when the door was taken off, the cladding would come with it. At the interface between the door and the rest of the wall, I removed the tongue from the boards either side and just butted them up to the adjacent boards, which means they look consistent, but there's no actual tongue groove connection between them. I used an electric brad nailer to pin the clad into the battens together with 50mm stainless steel brads. The rest of the cladding went on fairly easily, although I was always trying to keep in front of the impending rain. This caught up with me in the end eventually, just as I was giving the clad in another coat of paint. There's nothing like painting in the rain. So now I've finished the cladding, I can fix the trim around the outside. And this is just going all around the perimeter of it, like a frame around a painting. Now, I'm still going to have a 20mm gap between this trim and the brickwork on either side and the steel beam at the top, and probably a 30-40mm gap at the bottom. From a few metres away, I don't think you'll see that. It's just going to look like a shadow gap. What it does do is keep this away from all the surfaces, keep it drier, and hopefully extend its life. On each corner, I'm going to be putting a simple butt joint. I'm not going to mitre it because I think this timber over the next few months is going to shrink and any mitre I put in is just going to open up and look a bit rubbish. So I'm just going to do simple butt joints and if they do open up, I don't think they're going to look nearly so bad. That's a theory anyway. So once I get this on, then I can get on the inside and finish the inside wall. I used external screws to fix the trim all the way around and at the bottom I had to split the trim into three sections as the middle one is connected to the door and will obviously come out with it when I remove it. I put a 10 degree mitre on these front to back so the side pieces sit slightly behind the section that's connected to the door. This will make it easier to pull out the door and hopefully hide the joint. The countersunk screw holes could then be filled and I was ready for another coat of paint. On the inside, before I installed the insulation, I decided I might, in the future, have a workbench or tabletop up against this wall. So I installed some more 2x4 framing at the same height as my current workbench, which will give a future structure a better fixing. I also put some noggins in the beam at the top, just to help fix the ply that's going to run past this beam up to the ceiling. You'll notice I didn't end up with rock wall in the end. When I finally went down the shop to buy some, you know the shop that keeps telling you you can do it, it was a lot more expensive than I thought. And actually I'm not that fussed about the insulation in this wall. Although I want some, I don't want to spend too much money on it. So I ended up with this stuff and it's fairly cheap and cheerful and it's really, really hairy. I'm not sure what it's called, but I call it Chewbacca. <laughs> Having deleted the windows, I thought I'd leave the window frames in, just in case I change my mind in the future. I trimmed the ply sheets to the correct width. Height-wise, they're just a touch short, so I'll end up fixing a bit of a skirting to hide the gap. You'll see here, I've pinned a 14mm packer to the underside of the joist. So with the ply pinned tight up against it, I'll have a suitable gap for my future 12mm plasterboard, which I intend to clad the ceiling with. Most of the sheathing is now fixed on the inside and I've just filled all the holes with filler. I'm just waiting for that to go off so I can sand it down. So I've just moved on to the construction of this centre inside door. I'm going to be building it out of 12mm ply again with a timber frame, very similar to the outside door. The only difference is I'm going to hang this with a couple of hinges on the inside so it's easy to open. I couldn't use hinges on the outside door because you'd end up seeing them and I wanted an invisible door. Now the only challenge I've got with this is that this is where the hinge is going to go and I've got the end of the ply and the frame and this sort of gap interface between the two and I'm a little bit concerned about the fixing in there. So what I've done is I've gone and bought a pair of what's called Parliament hinges. And Parliament hinge is a standard hinge but it's got an extra setback to where it rotates. Normally these are used in this type of position 
so the door can open 180 degrees and when it does open 180 degrees it's well away from the wall missing the architrave and the skirting. Now I'm not going to use it in that type of configuration, I'm going to use it as a standard hinge but what it does mean is that my fixings are all going to be well into the frame rather than into this sort of ply frame interface. So that should work, I think, a little bit better. So once that door is on, sand this down and I should be ready for a coat of paint. The centre internal door I built in the similar way to the external one by fitting the frame in place first, here already wedged into position and then offering up the ply to it. And after fixing together with a couple of temporary screws, it can be taken out and joined properly. I use my router to very quickly take out material to the correct depth for the hinges. And here's a tip for you. If you don't have a nail bar, you can always use a spade to help lift the door while fixing. Without using some kind of lever, this type of job is really difficult. Although I don't really like wearing tool belts, when you're working on your own like I am, they're invaluable as you've always got one hand holding the door on the ply and you really need your tools and screwdrivers within easy reach. Once the door was on, I could fit the very last panel above it. The primer I'm using here is Leyland Trade Acrylic Primer Stroke Undercoat, which works well for me. Just to finish the door off, I jam it open with a piece of timber so I can fix two simple security bolts, one top and bottom, just to hold it closed. These aren't really for security, as the outside door will do that. It's just the cheapest way I came up with fixing it in place, not have any door handle protrude into the workshop. As this door isn't going to be used very often, if I was really rough, I could actually just use a couple of screws to keep it closed. I mean, I'm rough, but not that rough. And that is the job done. The inside door allows me to unscrew the external door, allowing me to lift out the external door and move it out the way. I expect to open this only a few times a year, so if it takes me five minutes, it's really not the end of the world. The inside door closes and it locks, yes. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, please check out the other ones on my channel and please, please subscribe. There's a huge amount of material on its way down the pipeline and you won't want to miss it, especially on this garage to workshop conversion. I've got the side door, the ceiling, the lights, the electrics and the whole fit out as well. So please hit this button here to subscribe and I'll see you next time.